Part four, chapter nine of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part four, a voyage to the country of the Whinhams. Chapter nine. A grand debate at the General Assembly of the Houynhnms, and how it was determined. The learning of the Houynhnms, their buildings, their manner of burials. The defectiveness of their language. One of these grand assemblies was held in my time, about three months before my departure, whither my master went as the representative of our district. In this council was resumed their old debate, and indeed the only debate that ever happened in their country whereof my master, after his return, gave me a very particular account. The question to be debated was whether the Yahoo should be exterminated from the face of the earth. One of the members for the affirmative offered several arguments of great strength and weight, alleging that as the Yahoos were the most filthy, noisome, and deformed animals which nature ever produced, so they were the most restive and indocible, mischievous, and malicious they would privately suck the teats of the Houynhnms cows, kill and devour their cats, trample down their oats and grass, if they were not continually watched, and commit a thousand other extravagances. He took notice of a general tradition, that Yahoos had not always been in their country, but that many ages ago two of these brutes appeared together upon a mountain, whether produced by the heat of the sun upon corrupted mud and slime, or from the ooze and froth of the sea, was never known. That these yahoos engendered, and their brood, in a short time, grew so numerous as to overrun and infest the whole nation. That the Houynhnms, to get rid of this evil, made a general hunting, and at last enclosed the whole herd, and destroying the elder, every Houynhnm kept two young ones in a kennel, and brought them to such a degree of tameness, as an animal so savage by nature can be capable of acquiring, using them for draught and carriage. That there seemed to be much truth in this tradition, and that those creatures could not be yin yamshi, or aborigines of the land. Because of the violent hatred of the Houynhnms, as well as all other animals, bore them, which, although their evil disposition sufficiently deserved, could never have arrived at so high a degree if they had been aborigines, or else they would have long since been rooted out. That the inhabitants, taking a fancy to use the service of the Yahoos, had, very imprudently, neglected to cultivate the breed of asses, which are a comely animal, easily kept, more tame and orderly, without any offensive smell, strong enough for labour, although they yield to the other in agility of body. And if their braying be no agreeable sound, it is far preferable to the horrible howlings of the Yahoos. Several others declared their sentiments to the same purpose. When my master proposed an expedient to the assembly, whereof he had borrowed the hint from me, he approved of the tradition mentioned by the honourable member who spoke before, and affirmed, that the two yahoos said to be seen first among them, had been driven thither over the sea, that coming to land and being forsaken by their companions, they retired to the mountains, and, degenerating by degrees, became in process of time much more savage than those of their own species, in the country whence these two originals came. The reason of this assertion was, that he had now in his possession a certain wonderful yahoo, meaning myself, which most of them had heard of, and many of them had seen. He then related to them how he first found me, that my body was all covered with an artificial composure of the skins and hairs of other animals, that I spoke in a language of my own, and had thoroughly learned theirs, that I had related to him the accidents which brought me thither, that when he saw me without my covering, I was an exact yahoo in every part, only of a whiter colour, less hairy, and with shorter claws. He added, how I had endeavoured to persuade him, that in my own and other countries, 
the Yahoos acted as the governing rational animal, and held the Huynans in servitude. That he observed in me all the qualities of a Yahoo, only a little more civilized by some tincture of reason, which, however, was in a degree as far inferior to the Huynam race as the Yahoos of their country were to me. That, among other things, I mentioned a custom we had of castrating Winhams when they were young, in order to render them tame, that the operation was easy and safe, that it was no shame to learn wisdom from brutes, as industry is taught by the ant, and building by the swallow. For so I translate the word lahana, although it be a much larger fowl. That this invention might be practised upon the younger yahoos here, which, besides rendering them tractable and fitter for use, would, in an age, put an end to the whole species, without destroying life. That, in the meantime, the Huynams should be exhorted to cultivate the breed of asses, which, as they are in all respects more valuable brutes, so they have this advantage, to be fit for service at five years old, which the others are not till twelve. This was all my master thought fit to tell me, at that time, of what passed in the Grand Council, that he was pleased to conceal one particular, which related personally to myself, whereof I soon felt the unhappy effect, as the reader will know in its proper place, and whence I date all the succeeding misfortunes of my life. The Huynams have no letters, and consequently their knowledge is all traditional. But there happening few events of any moment among a people so well united, naturally disposed to every virtue, wholly governed by reason, and cut off from all commerce with other nations, the historical part is easily preserved, without burdening their memories. I have already observed that they are subject to no diseases, and therefore can have no need of physicians. However, they have excellent medicines, composed of herbs, to cure accidental bruises and cuts in the pastern or frog of the foot, by sharp stones, as well as other maims and hurts in the several parts of the body. They calculate the year by the revolution of the sun and moon, but use no subdivisions into weeks. They are well enough acquainted with the motions of those two luminaries, and understand the nature of eclipses, and this is the utmost progress of their astronomy. In poetry they must be allowed to excel all other mortals, and the minuteness as well as exactness of their descriptions are indeed inimitable. Their verses abound very much in both of these, and usually contain either some exalted notions of friendship and benevolence, or the praises of those who are victors in races and other bodily exercises. Their buildings, although very rude and simple, are not inconvenient, but well contrived to defend them from all injuries of cold and heat. They have a kind of tree, which, at forty years old, loosens in the root, and falls with the first storm. It grows very straight, and being pointed like stakes with a sharp stone, for the Huynams know not the use of iron, they stick them erect in the ground, about ten inches asunder, and then weave in oat straw, or sometimes wattles, between them. The roof is made after the same manner, and so are the doors. The Huynams use the hollow part, between the pastern and the hoof of their forefoot, as we do our hands and this with greater dexterity than I could at first imagine. I have seen a white mare of our family thread a needle, which I lent her on purpose, with that joint. They milk their cows, reap their oats, and do all the work which requires hands in the same manner. They have a kind of hard flints, which, by grinding against other stones, they form into instruments, that serve instead of wedges, axes, and hammers. With tools made of these flints, they likewise cut their hay, and reap their oats, which they grow naturally in several fields. The yahoos draw home the sheaves in carriages, and the servants tread them in certain covered huts to get out the grain, which is kept in stores. They make a rude kind of earthen and wooden vessels, and bake the former in the sun. If they can avoid casualties, they die only of old age and are buried in the obscurest places that can be found. 
their friends and relations expressing neither joy nor grief at their departure. Nor does the dying person discover the least regret that he is leaving the world, any more than if he were returning home from a visit to one of his neighbours. I remember my master having once made an appointment with a friend and his family to come to his house, upon some affair of importance. On the day fixed, the mistress and her two children came very late. She made two excuses. First, for her husband, who, as she said, happened that very morning to schnew one. The word is strongly expressive in their language, but not easily rendered into English. It signifies to retire to his first mother. Her excuse for not coming sooner was that her husband dying late in the morning, she was a good while consulting her servants about a convenient place where his body should be laid. And I observed she behaved herself at our house as cheerfully as the rest. She died about three months after. They live generally to seventy or seventy-five years, very seldom to fourscore. Some weeks before their death they feel a gradual decay, but without pain. During this time they are much visited by their friends, because they cannot go abroad with their usual ease and satisfaction. However, about ten days before their death, which they seldom fail in computing, they return the visits that have been made to them by those who are nearest in the neighbourhood, being carried in a convenient sledge drawn by yahoos, which vehicle they use, not only upon this occasion, but when they grow old, upon long journeys, or when they are lamed by any accident. And therefore, when the dying Quinnams return those visits, they take a solemn leave of their friends, as if they were going to some remote part of the country, where they design to pass the rest of their lives. I know not whether it may be worth observing, that the Quinnams have no word in their language to express anything that is evil, except what they borrow from the deformities or ill qualities of the yahoos. Thus they denote the folly of a servant, an omission of a child, a stone that cuts their feet, a countenance of foul or unseasonable weather, and the like, by adding to each the epithet of yahoo, for instance, hum yahoo, one al hum yahoo, yin yal hum dawalma yahoo, and an ill-contrived house, Yin Holm Hun Ro Holna Yahoo. I could with great pleasure enlarge further upon the manners and virtues of this excellent people, but intending in a short time to publish a volume by itself expressly upon that subject, I refer the reader thither, and in the meantime proceed to relate my own sad catastrophe. End of part four, chapter nine. Part four, chapter ten of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part four, A Voyage to the Country of the Houyhnhnms, Chapter ten. The author's economy and happy life among the Houyhnhnms, his great improvement in virtue by conversing with them, their conversations. The author has notice given him by his master that he must depart from the country. He falls into a swoon for grief, but submits. He contrives and finishes a canoe by the help of a fellow servant, and puts to sea at a venture. I had settled my little economy to my own heart's content. My master had ordered a room to be made for me, after their manner, about six yards from the house, the sides and floors of which I plastered with clay, and covered with rush mats of my own contriving. I had beaten hemp, which there grows wild, and made of it a sort of tickling. This I filled with the feathers of several birds I had taken with springs made of yahoo's hairs and were excellent food. I had worked two chairs with my knife, the sorrel nag helping me in the grosser and more laborious part. When my clothes were worn to rags, I made myself others with the skins of rabbits, 
and of a certain beautiful animal, about the same size, called Nahono, the skin of which is covered with a fine down. Of these I also made very tolerable stockings. I sold my shoes with wood, which I cut from a tree, and fitted to the upper leather, and when this was worn out, I supplied it with the skins of yahoos dried in the sun. I often got honey out of hollow trees, which I mingled with water or ate with my bread. No man could more verify the truth of these two maxims, that nature is very easily satisfied, and that necessity is the mother of invention. I enjoyed perfect health of body and tranquillity of mind. I did not feel the treachery or inconsistency of a friend, nor the injuries of a secret or open enemy. I had no occasion of bribing, flattering, or pimping, to procure the favour of any great man or his minion. I wanted no fence against fraud or oppression. Here was neither physician to destroy my body, nor lawyer to ruin my fortune, no informer to watch my words and actions, or forge accusations against me for hire. Here were no gibers, censures, backbiters, pickpockets, highwaymen, housebreakers, attorneys, boards, buffoons, gamesters, politicians, wits, splenetics, tedious talkers, controvertists, ravishers, murderers, robbers, virtuosos, no leaders or followers of party and faction, no encouragers to vice by seducement or examples, no dungeon, axes, gibbets, whipping posts or pillories, no cheating shopkeepers or merchants, no pride, vanity or affectation, no fops, bullies, drunkards, strolling whores or poxes, no ranting, lewd, expensive wives, no stupid, proud pedants, no importunate, overbearing, quarrelsome, noisy, roaring, empty, conceited, swearing companions, no scoundrels raised from the dust upon the merit of their vices, or nobility thrown into it on account of their virtues, no lords, fiddlers, judges, or dancing-masters. I had the favour of being admitted to several Whinhams, who came to visit or dine with my master, where his honour graciously suffered me to wait in the room and listen to their discourse. Both he and his company would often descend to ask me questions and receive my answers. I had also sometimes the honour of attending my master in his visits to others. I never presumed to speak, except in answer to a question, and then I did it with inward regret, because it was a loss of so much time for improving myself. But I was infinitely delighted with the situation of a humble auditor in such conversations where nothing passed but what was useful, expressed in the fewest and most significant words. Where, as I have already said, the greatest decency was observed, without the least degree of ceremony. Where no person spoke without being pleased himself, and pleasing his companions. Where there was no interruption, tediousness, heat, or difference of sentiments. They have a notion that, when people are met together, a short silence does much improve the conversation. This I found to be true, for, during those little intermissions of talk, new ideas would arise in their minds, which very much enlivened the discourse. Their subjects are generally on friendship and benevolence, on order and economy, sometimes upon the visible operations of nature, or ancient traditions, upon the bounds and limits of virtue, upon the unerring rules of reason, or upon some determinations to be taken at the next general assembly, and often upon the various excellences of poetry. I may add, without vanity, that my presence often gave them sufficient matter for discourse, because it afforded my master an occasion of letting his friends into the history of me and my country, upon which they were all pleased to discount in a manner not very advantageous to humankind, and for that reason I shall not repeat what they said, only I may be allowed to observe that his honour, to my great admiration, appeared to understand the nature of yahoos much better than myself. He went through all our vices and follies, and discovered many which I had never mentioned to him, by only supposing what qualities a yahoo of their country, with a small proportion of reason, 
might be capable of exerting, and concluded, with too much probability, how vile as well as miserable such a creature must be. I freely confess that all the little knowledge I have of any value was acquired by the lectures I received from my master, and from hearing the discourse of him and his friends, to which I should be prouder to listen than to dictate to the greatest and wisest assembly in Europe. I admired the strength, comeliness, and speed of the inhabitants, and such a constellation of virtues in such admirable persons produced in me the highest veneration. At first, indeed, I did not feel the natural awe which the yahoos and all other animals bear toward them, but it grew upon me by decrees much sooner than I imagined, and was mingled with respectful love and gratitude, that they would condescend to distinguish me from the rest of my species. All the human race in general, I considered them, as they really were, yahoos in shape and disposition, perhaps a little more civilized, and qualified with the gift of speech, but making no other use of reason than to improve and multiply those vices whereof their brethren in this country had only the share that nature allotted them. When I happened to behold the reflection of my own form in a lake or fountain, I turned away my face in horror and detestation of myself, and could better endure the sight of a common yahoo than of my own person. By conversing with the Huynams and looking upon them with delight, I fell to imitate their gait and gesture, which is now grown into a habit, and my friends often tell me, in a blunt way, that I trot like a horse, which, however, I take for a great compliment. Neither shall I disown, that in speaking I am apt to fall into the voice and manner of the Huynams, and hear myself ridiculed on that account, without the least mortification. In the midst of all this happiness, and when I looked upon myself to be fully settled for life, my master sent for me one morning a little earlier than his usual hour. I observed by his countenance that he was in some perplexity, and at a loss how to begin what he had to speak. After a short silence he told me, he did not know how I would take what he was going to say, that in the last general assembly, when the affair of the yahoos was entered upon, the representatives had taken offence at his keeping a yahoo, meaning myself, in his family, more like a whinnam than a brute animal, that he was known frequently to converse with me, as if he could receive some advantage or pleasure in my company, that such a practice was not agreeable to reason or nature, or a thing ever heard of before among them. The assembly did therefore exhort him either to employ me like the rest of my species, or command me to swim back to the place whence I came. That the first of these expedients was utterly rejected by all the Huynams who had ever seen me at his house or their own, for they alleged that because I had some rudiments of reason, added to the natural pravity of those animals, it was to be feared I might be able to seduce them into the woody and mountainous parts of the country, and bring them in troops by night to destroy the Huynams' cattle as being naturally of the ravenous kind, and averse from labour. My master added, that he was daily pressed by the Huynams of the neighbourhood, to have the assembly's exhortation executed, which he could not put off much longer. He doubted it would be impossible for me to swim to another country, and therefore wished I would contrive some sort of vehicle, resembling those I had described to him, that might carry me on the sea in which work I should have the assistance of his own servants, as well as those of his neighbours. He concluded that, for his own part, he could have been content to keep me in his service as long as I lived, because he found I had cured myself of some bad habits and dispositions, by endeavouring, as far as my inferior nature was capable, to imitate the Huynams. I should here observe to the reader that a decree of the General Assembly in this country, expressed by the word Hunholnyayan, which signifies an exhortation, as near as I can render it, for they have no conception how a rational creature can be compelled, but only advised or exhorted, because no person can disobey reason, 
without giving up his claim to be a rational creature. I was struck with the utmost grief and despair at my master's discourse, and being unable to support the agonies I was under, I fell into a swoon at his feet. When I came to myself, he told me that he concluded I had been dead, for these people are subject to no such imbecilities of nature. I answered in a faint voice, that death would have been too great a happiness, that, although I could not blame the assembly's exhortation, or the urgency of his friends, yet, in my weak and corrupt judgment, I thought it might consist with reason to have been less rigorous, that I could not swim a league, and probably the nearest land to theirs might be a distance above a hundred, that many materials, necessary for making a small vessel to carry me off, were wholly wanting in this country, which, however, I would attempt, in obedience and gratitude to his honour, although I concluded the thing to be impossible, and therefore looked on myself as already devoted to destruction, that the certain prospect of an unnatural death was the least of my evils. For, supposing I should escape with my life by some strange adventure, how could I think with temper of passing my days among yahoos, and relapsing into my old corruptions, for want of examples to lead and keep me within the paths of virtue? that I knew too well upon what solid reasons all the determinations of the wise Hwinnams were founded, not to be shaken by arguments of mine, a miserable Yahoo. And therefore, after presenting him with my humble thanks for the offer of his servant's assistance in making a vessel, and desiring a reasonable time for so difficult a work, I told him I would endeavour to preserve a wretched being, and, if I ever returned to England, was not without hopes of being useful to my own species, by celebrating the praises of the renowned Hwinnams, and proposing their virtues to the imitation of mankind. My master, in a few words, made me a very gracious reply, allowed me the space of two months to finish my boat, and ordered the sorrel nag, my fellow-servant, for so at this distance I may presume to call him, to follow my instruction, because I told my master that his help would be sufficient, and I knew he had a tenderness for me. In his company my first business was to go to that part of the coast where my rebellious crew had ordered me to be set on shore. I got upon a height, and looking on every side into the sea, fancied I saw a small island towards the northeast. I took out my pocket-glass, and could then clearly distinguish it above five leagues off, as I computed but it appeared to the sorrel nag to be only a blue cloud, for as he had no conception of any country beside his own, so he could not be expected in distinguishing remote objects at sea, as we who so much converse in that element. After I had discovered this island, I considered no further, but resolved it should, if possible, be the first place of my banishment, leaving the consequence to fortune. I returned home, and, consulting with a sorrel nag, we went into a copse at some distance, where I, with my knife, and he with a sharp flint, fastened very artificially after their manner to a wooden handle, cut down several oak wattles, about the thickness of a walking-staff, and some larger pieces. But I shall not trouble the reader with a particular description of my own mechanics. Let it suffice to say, that, in six weeks' time, with the help of the sorrel nag, who performed the parts that required most labour, I finished a sort of Indian canoe, but much larger, covering it with the skins of yahoos, well stitched together with hemp and threads of my own making. My sail was likewise composed of the skins of the same animal, but I made use of the youngest I could get, the older being too tough and thick, and I likewise provided myself with four paddles. I laid in a stock of boiled flesh, of rabbits and fowls, and took with me two vessels, one filled with milk, and the other with water. I tried my canoe in a large pond, near my master's house, and then corrected in it what was amiss, stopping all the chinks with Yahoo's tallow, till I found it staunch, and able to bear me and my freight, and, when it was as complete as I could make it, I had it drawn on a carriage very gently by Yahoo's to the seaside, 
under the conduct of the sorrel nag and another servant. When I was ready, and the day came for my departure, I took leave of my master and lady and the whole family, my eyes flowing with tears and my heart quite sunk with grief. But his honour, out of curiosity, and perhaps, if I may speak without vanity, partly out of kindness, was determined to see me in my canoe, and got several of his neighbouring friends to accompany him. I was forced to wait above an hour for the tide, and then, observing the wind very fortunately bearing towards the island, to which I intended to steer my course, I took a second leave of my master. But, as I was going to prostrate myself to kiss his hoof, he did me the honour to raise it gently to my mouth. I am not ignorant how much I have been censured for mentioning this last particular. Detractors are pleased to think it improbable that so illustrious a person should descend to give so great a mark of distinction to a creature so inferior as I. Neither have I forgotten how apt some travellers are to boast of extraordinary favours they have received. But if these censures were better acquainted with the noble and courteous dispositions of the Huynhams, they would soon change their opinion. I paid my respects to the rest of the Huynhams in his honour's company. Then, getting into my canoe, I pushed off from shore. End of part four, chapter ten. Part four, chapter eleven of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part four. A Voyage to the Country of the Huynhams. Chapter eleven. The author's dangerous voyage. He arrives at New Holland, hoping to settle there. Is wounded with an arrow by one of the natives. Is seized and carried by force into a Portuguese ship. THE GREAT CIVILITIES OF THE CAPTAIN, THE AUTHOR ARRIVES AT ENGLAND. I began this desperate voyage on February 15th, 1714-15, at nine o'clock in the morning. The wind was very favourable, however I made use at first only of my paddles, but, considering I should soon be weary, and that the wind might chop about, I ventured to set up my little sail. And thus, with the help of the tide, I went at the rate of a league and a half an hour, as near as I could guess. My master and his friends continued on the shore till I was almost out of sight, and I often heard the sorrel nag, who always loved me, crying out, Hanya ilya nea maja yahoo! Take care of thyself, gentle yahoo! My design was, if possible, to discover some small island uninhabited, yet sufficient by my labour, to furnish me with the necessaries of life, which I would have thought a greater happiness than to be first minister in the politest court of Europe. So horrible was the idea I conceived of returning to live in society and under the government of Yahoos. For in such a solitude as I desired, I could at least enjoy my own thoughts and reflect with delight on the virtues of those inimitable Huynhams, without an opportunity of degenerating into the vices and corruptions of my own species. The reader may remember what I related, when my crew conspired against me and confined me to my cabin, how I continued there several weeks without knowing what course we took, and when I was put ashore in the long-boat, how the sailors told me with oaths, whether true or false, that they knew not in what part of the world we were. However, I did then believe us to be about ten degrees southward of the Cape of Good Hope, or about forty-five degrees southern latitude, as I gathered from some general words I overheard among them, being, I suppose, to the south-east in their intended voyage to Madagascar. And although this was little better than conjecture, yet I resolved to steer my course eastward, hoping to reach the south-west coast of New Holland, and perhaps some such island as I desired lying westward of it. The wind was full west, 
and by six in the evening I computed I had gone eastward at least eighteen leagues, when I spied a very small island about half a league off, which I soon reached. It was nothing but a rock, with one creek naturally arched by the force of tempests. Here I put in my canoe, and climbing a part of the rock, I could plainly discover land to the east, extending from south to north. I lay all night in my canoe, and repeating my voyage early in the next morning, I arrived in seven hours to the southeast point of New Holland. This confirmed me in the opinion I have long entertained, that the maps and charts place this country at least three degrees more to the east than it really is, which thought I communicated many years ago to my worthy friend Mr. Herman Moll, and gave him my reasons for it although he has rather chosen to follow other authors. I saw no inhabitants in the place where I landed, and, being unarmed, I was afraid of venturing far into the country. I found some shellfish on the shore, and ate them raw, not daring to kindle a fire, for fear of being discovered by the natives. I continued three days feeding on oysters and limpets, to save my own provisions and I fortunately found a brook of excellent water, which gave me great relief. On the fourth day, venturing out early a little too far, I saw twenty or thirty natives upon a height not above five hundred yards from me. They were stark naked, men, women, and children, round a fire, as I could discover by the smoke. One of them spied me, and gave notice to the rest, Five of them advanced towards me, leaving the women and children at the fire. I made what haste I could to the shore, and getting into my canoe, shoved off. The savages, observing me retreat, ran after me, and before I could get far enough into the sea, discharged an arrow which wounded me deeply on the inside of my left knee. I shall carry the mark to my grave. I apprehended the arrow might be poisoned, and paddling out of reach of their darts, being a calm day, I made a shift to suck the wound and dress it as well as I could. I was at a loss what to do, for I durst not return to the same landing place, but stood to the north, and was forced to paddle, for the wind, though very gentle, was against me, blowing northwest. As I was looking about for a secure landing place, I saw a sail to the north-north-east, which, appearing every minute more visible, I was in some doubt whether I should wait for them or not. But, at last, my detestation of the Yahoo race prevailed, and turning my canoe, I sailed and paddled together to the south, and got into the same creek whence I set out in the morning, choosing, rather, to trust myself among these barbarians than live with the European Yahoos. I drew up my canoe as close as I could to the shore, and hid myself behind a stone by the little brook, which, as I have already said, was excellent water. The ship came within half a league of this creek, and sent a long boat with vessels to take in fresh water, for the place, it seems, was very well known. But I did not observe it till the boat was almost on shore, and it was too late to seek another hiding place. The seamen at their landing observed my canoe, and rummaging it all over, easily conjectured that the owner could not be far off. Four of them, well armed, searched every cranny and lurking hole, till at last they found me flat on my face behind the stone. They gazed a while in admiration at my strange, uncouth dress, my coat made of skins, my wooden-soled shoes, and my third stockings. Whence, however, they concluded, I was not a native of the place, who all go naked. One of the seamen, in Portuguese, bid me rise, and asked who I was. I understood that language very well, and getting upon my feet, said, I was a poor Yahoo, banished from the Whinhams, and desired they would please to let me depart. They admired to hear me answer them in their own tongue, and saw by my complexion I must be a European, but were at a loss to know what I meant by Yahoos and Whinhams. 
and at the same time fell a-laughing at my strange tone in speaking, which resembled the neighing of a horse. I trembled all the while betwixt fear and hatred. I again desired leave to depart, and was gently moving to my canoe, but they laid hold of me, desiring to know what country I was of, whence I came, with many other questions. I told them I was born in England, whence I came about five years ago, and then their country and ours were at peace. I therefore hoped they would not treat me as an enemy, since I meant them no harm, but was a poor Yahoo seeking some desolate place where to pass the remainder of his unfortunate life. When they began to talk, I thought I never heard or saw anything more unnatural, for it appeared to me as monstrous as if a dog or a cow should speak in England, or a yahoo in Whinhamland. The honest Portuguese were equally amazed at my strange dress, and the odd manner of delivering my words, which, however, they understood very well. They spoke to me with great humanity, and said, They were sure the captain would carry me gratis to Lisbon, whence I might return to my own country that two of the seamen would go back to the ship, inform the captain of what they had seen, and receive his orders. In the meantime, unless I would give my solemn oath not to fly, they would secure me by force. I thought it best to comply with their proposal. They were very curious to know my story, but I gave them very little satisfaction, and they all conjectured that my misfortunes had impaired my reason. In two hours the boat, which was laden with vessels of water, returned, with the captain's command to fetch me on board. I fell on my knees to preserve my liberty, but all was in vain, and the men, having tied me with cords, heaved me into the boat, whence I was taken into the ship, and thence into the captain's cabin. His name was Pedro de Mendez. He was a very courteous and generous person. He entreated me to give some account of myself, and desired to know what I would eat or drink, said, I should be used as well as himself, and spoke so many obliging things, that I wondered to find such civilities from a yahoo. However, I remained silent and sullen. I was ready to faint at the very smell of him and his men. At last I desired something to eat out of my own canoe but he ordered me a chicken and some excellent wine, and then directed I should be put to bed in a very clean cabin. I would not undress myself, but lay on the bedclothes, and in half an hour stole out, when I thought the crew was at dinner, and getting to the side of the ship, was going to leap into the sea and swim for my life, rather than continue among the yahoos. But one of the seamen prevented me, and having informed the captain, I was chained to my cabin. After dinner, Don Pedro came to me, and desired to know my reason for so desperate an attempt. Assured me, he only meant to do me all the service he was able, and spoke so very movingly, that at last I descended to treat him like an animal which had some little portion of reason. I gave him a very short relation of my voyage, of the conspiracy against me by my own men, of the country where they set me on shore, and my five years of residence there. All which he looked upon as if it were a dream or a vision, whereat I took great offence, for I had quite forgot the faculty of lying, so peculiar to yahoos, in all the countries where they preside, and, consequently, their disposition of suspecting truth in others of their own species. I asked him whether it were the custom in his country to say the thing which was not. I assured him I had almost forgot what he meant by falsehood, and if I had lived a thousand years in Whinhamland, I should never have heard a lie from the meanest servant, that I was altogether indifferent whether he believed me or not. But, however, in return for his favours, I would give so much allowance to the corruption of his nature as to answer any objection he would please to make and then he might easily discover the truth. The captain, a wise man, 
after many endeavours to catch me tripping in some part of my story, at last began to have a better opinion of my veracity. But he added, that, since I professed so inviolable an attachment to truth, I must give him my word and honour to bear him company in this voyage, without attempting anything against my life, or else he would continue me as a prisoner till we arrived at Lisbon. I gave him the promise he required, but at the same time protested, that I would suffer the greatest hardships, rather than return to live among the Yahoos. A voyage passed without any considerable accident. In gratitude to the captain, I sometimes sat with him in his earnest request, and strove to conceal my antipathy against humankind, although it often broke out, which he suffered to pass without observation. But the greatest part of the day I confined myself to my cabin, to avoid seeing any of the crew. The captain had often entreated me to strip myself of my savage dress, and offered to lend me the best suit of clothes he had. This I would not be prevailed on to accept, abhorring to cover myself with anything that had been on the back of a yahoo. I only desired he would lend me two clean shirts, which, having been washed since he wore them, I believed would not so much defile me. These I changed every second day, and washed them myself. We arrived at Lisbon, November 5th, 1715. At our landing, the captain forced me to cover myself with his cloak, to prevent the rabble from crowding about me. I was conveyed to his own house, and, at my earnest request, he led me up to the highest room backwards. I conjured him to conceal from all persons what I had told him of the Whinhams, because the least hint of such a story would not only draw numbers of people to see me, but probably put me in danger of being imprisoned or burnt by the Inquisition. The captain persuaded me to accept a suit of clothes newly made, but I would not suffer the tailor to take my measure. However, Don Pedro being almost of my size, they fitted me well enough. He accoutred me with other necessaries, all new, which I aired for twenty-four hours before I would use them. The captain had no wife, nor above three servants, none of which were suffered to attend at meals, and his whole deportment was so obliging, added to a very good human understanding, that I really began to tolerate his company. He gained so far upon me, that I ventured to look out of the back window. By degrees I was brought into another room, whence I peeped into the street, but drew my head back in a fright. In a week's time he seduced me down to the door. I found my terror gradually lessened, but my hatred and contempt seemed to increase. I was at last bold enough to walk the street in his company, but kept my nose well stopped with rue or sometimes with tobacco. In ten days Don Pedro, to whom I had given some account of my domestic affairs, put it upon me, as a matter of honour and conscience, that I ought to return to my native country, and live at home with my wife and children. He told me, there was an English ship in the port just ready to sail, and he would furnish me with all things necessary. It would be tedious to repeat his arguments and my contradictions. He said, it was altogether impossible to find such a solitary island as I desired to live in, but I might command in my own house, and pass my time in a manner as recluse as I pleased. I complied at last, finding I could not do better. I left Lisbon the twenty-fourth day of November, in an English merchantman, but who was the master I never inquired. Don Pedro accompanied me to the ship, and lent me twenty pounds. He took kind leave of me, and embraced me at a parting, which I bore as well as I could. During this last voyage I had no commerce with the master or any of his men, but, pretending I was sick, kept clothes in my cabin. On the 5th of December, 1715, we cast anchor in the Downs, about nine in the morning, and, at three in the afternoon, I got safe to my house at Rotherheath. 
my wife and family received me with great surprise and joy, because they concluded me certainly dead. But I must freely confess, the sight of them filled me only with hatred, disgust, and contempt, and the more by reflecting on the near alliance I had to them. For although since my unfortunate exile from the Wynnum country, I had compelled myself to tolerate the sight of Yahoos, and to converse with Don Pedro de Mendez, yet my memory and imagination were perpetually filled with the virtues and ideas of those exalted Wynnums. And when I began to consider that, by copulating with one of the Yahoo species, I had become a parent of more, it struck me with the utmost shame, confusion, and horror. As soon as I entered the house, my wife took me in her arms and kissed me, at which, having not been used to the touch of that odious animal for so many years, I fell into a swoon for almost an hour. At the time I am writing, it is five years since my last return to England. During the first year I could not endure my wife or children in my presence. The very smell of them was intolerable. Much less could I suffer them to eat in the same room. To this hour they dare not presume to touch my bread or drink out of the same cup. Neither was I ever able to let one of them take me by the hand. The first money I laid out was to buy two young stone horses, which I keep in a good stable, and next to them the groom is my greatest favourite, for I feel my spirits revived by the smell he contracts in the stables. My horses understand me tolerably well. I converse with them at least four hours every day. They are strangers to bridle or saddle. They live in great amity with me and friendship to each other. End of part four, chapter eleven.